Well, good morning. We're so glad that you're here and you've joined us online. And I'm so excited to take us through this passage or this verse, should I say, today. You may wonder, well, why are we just taking one verse? Normally we take a few verses or a larger passage. But there's so much depth and significance and joy in this one verse that if we would submit to it and sit under today, I believe through God and through his Spirit's work, through his word, he could utterly transform us to be this people as Jesus brings to conclusion a particular section on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, now this verse is often referred to as the golden rule. That phrase was coined, we believe, roughly in the third century through the Roman emperor Alexander. And he would display this verse as a bit of a motto for life. And he would display it in his, in his buildings, his palace, and, and he would use it as a saying to try to promote peace amongst enemies, uh, amongst many other religions in the empire at the time. But it's a very significant verse in the Sermon on the Mount. It's significant for a number of reasons. It's significant, first, because it marks a concluding section in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see it begins with a so, or that word can be therefore. And when we come to a phrase like that, we have to ask, what is it there for? Why is it there? It's obviously concluding and based on a previous argument or set of teachings. But we have to understand which set of teachings is Jesus referring to so that we can understand the full weight and significance of the verse. Is it therefore simply in light of verse 11? Remember last week we saw that our, 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 our God is a perfect heavenly father and he gives us good gifts, so therefore persistently pursue him. Is it simply that because God is a good father, we should therefore be good to other people? I think it's a little bit more extensive than simply that. Is it based on verses 1 to 5, for example, where Jesus says, well, because you don't like to be judged, therefore don't judge other people. Treat other people as you wish to be treated. Is that what he's talking about? But that's confusing because it would mean that the bit in between 7 to 11, that Jesus just gets sidetracked along the way. Well, you see, I actually think the key uh, to the word therefore is unlocked by the phrase at the end of verse 12, which is, this is the law and prophets. I think what Jesus is doing is bringing to conclusion, uh, and this verse serves as a bookend, which began all the way back the last time Jesus used that phrase. Look back to chapter 5, verse 17. You'll see that Jesus said, remember he said, you're to be salt and light. And then verse 17, he says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he says that, that, that in light of that, you therefore need to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. And then he spent all his time from that point in the sermon seeking to unpack what it truly means to have a whole life righteousness where our inner being lines up with our external being, that merely these aren't religious deeds such as the Ten Commandments or, or the 637 laws in the Old Testament, they're not merely religious deeds to do to be accepted by God, but rather, because we are accepted by God and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, live this way, this whole life righteousness, because in so doing, you truly flourish. And as we truly flourish as the people of God, we will and are salt and light to the world. So I think what Jesus has been doing ever since chapter 5, verse 17, is unpacking this whole life righteousness, which he then summarizes and concludes with this summary, succinct one-liner, which is found in verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets. He's essentially telling us, do to others what you wish they would do to you. He summarizes and concludes all that he's taught thus far in that summary statement. The golden rule. Why is this so significant? Why is this so important? Well, firstly, the golden rule is right at the center of the way God wants us to live. Sadly, so many Christians believe that, the, that, that, that right at the center of living for God is simply to turn up the church, to read my Bible and pray and give. 
Sadly, so many Christians are walking around thinking that that's what it simply means to be a Christian, doing certain things to appease or keep myself in the favour of God. No, that's not what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You see, right at the, right at the centre of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is love. And the same phrase, the law and prophets, the same, the same summary statement that Jesus gives us is found elsewhere in Matthew's gospel. And I think by reading it helps us understand what Jesus is doing exactly in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 22, if you turn there. In Matthew 22, in verse 37 to 40, a, uh, 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 he was asked this question, and they were asking this question to try and catch him out, but, but if we follow along with it, it's important. He says in 36, Teacher, what is the greater commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. You see see that repeated phrase? It's Jesus comes to fulfill the law and prophets and then commissions us and sends us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, as disciples of Jesus, to then reflect him to the world. And how do we fulfill the law and prophets in our lives? We love God and we love others. That is what it means to live out our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. That is the golden rule right at the center of the way God wants us to live. It seems so obvious, doesn't it? Love God and love others. But gosh, how much do we complicate our relationship with Jesus? We think we need to know end time theology. We need to know predestination. We need to know the five points of Calvinism. We think we need to know all these theological arguments but, but they, and, and we, we should seek to understand those, but the whole purpose of understanding theology and doctrine is that it would lead me to love God and love others. If it doesn't, it is cold, it is lifeless, and it is dead doctrine. And dead doctrine and dead theology is exactly what Jesus criticized the Pharisees and Sadducees of. They were the ones who kept the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law was to seek to grow worshippers of God who loved him with heart, soul, mind and strength and loved others. Loved others as we want to be treated. How do we do this? Simply, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and prophets. But this isn't the only time we we see Jesus talk about this. We see this elsewhere in Scripture. In Galatians 5, verse 14, Paul himself says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We see it again in Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. At the very root of what it means to live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, right at the center of the way God wants us to live is love. The the, the very reason of the whole spiritual formation and disciplines conversation we've been having for a number of weeks, concerned about who we are becoming, is all about producing worshippers who love God and love others. It's not about adding religious deeds to our lives, but rather loving God and loving others. So first question. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And secondly, do you love others? Do you love your neighbor? Doing unto them what you want them to do to you. Faithfulness to God leaks into relationship with others. The way we love God has to spill into loving others. 
It's so sad to consider and to know and to see that we've somehow made it acceptable that somebody can say they love God yet be a tyrant as a boss, that they could say they love God but be a terrible spouse, a terrifying parent, a constantly rude to people uh, who provide services to them, that they would gossip, that they would um, um, be stingy and lack generosity. How, how can we comprehend that somebody would say they love God yet display attributes and characteristics just like that. Loving God means loving people in his image. If you live this way, Jesus says, you fulfill the scriptures. Jesus is calling us to live a way which is life-giving. The best way to live is the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus, the way of the kingdom, and the way of the kingdom is captured in this one statement sentence. The best way to live, the most flourishing way to live is to devote yourself, uh, not to yourself, but for others. It sounds counterintuitive. It goes against the cultural uh, grind, doesn't it? Look after number one. Do what suits you. Serve yourself. Look after yourself. Don't go out. Look after yourself. Stay in. No, it sounds counterintuitive, but it's the best thing to do. The golden rule, this one verse, this summary of the, all that Jesus has been talking, these bookends, within these bookends from 5.17 to 7.12, Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you to flourish. I'm inviting you to practical wisdom. It's an appeal to live as we were created and purposed to live. Simply treat others as you would want to be treated. Folks, imagine a world like this. Imagine if our world functioned like this. Imagine a world where what we deeply desire, we would extend to other people, which would mean that people extend what they desire toward us, treating people how we would want to be treated. It's, it's asking, how would I want to be treated in this scenario? And then moving to other people, toward other people, with those actions in mind. Folks, we all, we all desire to, ha to, to, be, to have our dignity intact, to be valued and respected in society, don't we? Well, do we value and respect other people? We all desire to be forgiven and loved and people to show us patience, but do we forgive? Do we love? Do we show patience? We, we all desire people to be honest with us and to share with us, but do we do that with other people? We, we all want to be taken seriously in life, but do we take other people seriously? We, we all desire people to show us mercy and show us grace, but do we show mercy and grace to other people? Oh, folks, this is, this is a stunning summary. And the weight of it comes after all that we've seen him teach thus far. This principle, this golden rule is right at the center of how God wants his people to live to love him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others, to love them in the way that we want to be loved, to treat them the way that we want to be treated. Secondly, the golden rule changes everything in relationships. But so often, everything I've described is we imagine a world where we would extend this and we would receive this to other people. It's not our experience, is it? Our failure as human beings to live by this golden rule is because we are instinctively and intuitively self-centered and selfish. And we live in a culture in a day and an age that encourages our selfishness. All of us in every relationship battle with not having our needs, our interests, our wants, our desires at the center of our thinking when we engage with other people. And we're lying if we don't say that's true. The Bible tells us we weren't created to be autonomous individual people, but rather created to be relational beings. We are made for relationship and community. But we rejected God. We rebelled against his ways. We, we sought to create our own purpose in life. And though we were made for him and created by him and created to reflect him, we walked away from that purpose and therefore we walked away from life itself. We walk into death, destruction, and simply destroyed. We created what we think is the best future. We, we think we know what is right and wrong. We think we know what true life means. We think we know what true flourishing means, but only as we do that, we essentially turn selfish and inward looking, much to the expense of all of humanity, 
not least in our relationship and communion with our Heavenly Father. Sin has so tainted us to the point where we can read this and go, yeah, this world would be better if we all lived like this. We believe it and, and we even desire, wouldn't it be great to put this into practice and see it happen around us, but yet we can't do it. Some of us don't want to do it, but all of us can't do it. Because we can't do relationship in its truest and fullest sense because we are intrinsically selfish. We, we take what is to be selfless in relationship and now you take relationships to serve self because we are so self-centered. This is not something unique to our culture, but it's something that has been true of humanity ever since the garden. And not least, in and through the use of this verse, I found three simple ways in which we see this saying twisted to reflect the fact that we are so selfish and self-centered. Pagan philosophers would use language such as this, hurt not others in ways that you would find hurtful. Conifius says, do not do to others, do not to others what you would not wish for yourself. And Rabbi Hillel, who, who was writing around this time, would say, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. Now, on first hearing, you may think, well, that just sounds just like what Jesus is saying. What is wrong with it? Oh, but no, it's not the same. You see, those three sayings reflect how we take what we were created for, selfless, sacrificial, serving relationships where we serve the other, and have twisted relationships to become selfish, self-centered, and self-serving. Why does that make sense? Well, listen again. Jesus says, whatever you wish others do to you, do also to them. Jesus wants us to step out into relationships and serve others. How do we know that? Everything he said to this point. Whereas what the least philosophers or rabbis of the time want to happen is that they talk about it in the negative. Don't do so they won't do to you. It's all in the negative. And because it's all in the negative, it leads to passivity and it leads to a justification in relationship to be disengaged from people. Whereas Jesus shows us in the gospel that people aren't just not to harm people, but rather to treat them as truly human and to be a disciple, to go and do something to them that you would want others to do to you. Jesus speaks about it in the positive, the actively engaged in relationship way. And folks, this is where we find it hard because this goes against our selfish, sinful ways. The positive is far more active and demanding. If you like being loved, love others. If you enjoy being treated fairly, treat others fairly. If you like receiving help, help others. The searching is far more searching and substantive, isn't it? Here, there is no permission simply to withdraw into a world where I offend nobody, which, folks, is the, the, the rhetoric of our age of tolerance, which isn't actually tolerance. The, the, we don't have permission to withdraw from the world and simply don't offend anybody because in that we accomplish no good in the midst of our world. Just think about, think about our communities. How would it be transformed if we positively stepped into a relationship with other people and sought to treat them the way that we want to be treated? Think of the dignity we would extend to all members of the community. Think, think of the perseverance and the love and the care and the forgiveness, the commitment, the thoughtfulness, the kindness that would exist in our communities. And we would, we would seek to extend that to others because we would want people to extend that to ourselves. But Jesus isn't saying we're to do this simply because we want them to do it to us. We do that, we extend it to them because in doing so we fulfill the greatest commandment to love God and to love others. The world is teaching you, just, just think about this. The world is currently teaching us right now to question how everybody else in the world is treating and viewing me. No, you can't disagree with that. The world is, is, is growing us, discipling us to ask the question, how are you treating me? But the world is not discipling us to ask the question, how am I treating other people? <laughs> it's so true, folks, isn't it? 
when the question should squarely land on our shoulders and we should be asked the question, how am I treating others? The one that is negative, who, who says, don't hurt other people so they won't hurt you, that is a negative form, is simply a restrictive life, whereas the positive form of Jesus that says, go toward, move toward other people and love them in the way that you want to be loved is a proactive way. Imagine a world, imagine it, folks, if we live in a world where we all function like that. Imagine a world in the workplace if we applied the golden rule to it. Think about it. What do you want from a coworker or a boss? We want them to work hard. We want them to be honest. We want them to be respectful. We want them to give praise. We want to give them to give affirmation. We want them to be a team player. We want them to be fair. We'll be that type of coworker. Rather than sitting on your desk and waiting for somebody to come to you. And you sit at your desk and you stew going, well, nobody's treating me like this. So why don't they give me praise? Why does nobody notice me? Imagine in our relationships with our friendships. You see, you, you want a friend to initiate contact. You, you, you sit insecurely thinking, when will they reach out to me? Or nobody's text messaged me or nobody's WhatsApp me. Why has nobody called me? But the question rather is, when did you call them? <laughs> When we desire contact and care and encouragement and truth, we're to be that type of friend. Think about our family and our homes. We, we want safety and we want care, we want help, we want enjoyment, but many of us are expecting our families to live off the fumes and the leftovers we have and wonder why they don't love us the way that we want to be loved. Well, love in the way that you want to be loved. Think about the communication just in this world. Think about social media, which is just a, such a horrible place at the minute. Imagine if, if there was fairness where we were heard at face value and people assumed the best of our communication rather than being cynical and critical and, and seeking to understand well, what they really meant was this. Aren't we? We're, honestly, we're cynics, aren't we? We're, we're like, well, what did you mean by that? We don't listen, we don't hear, we seek to criticize and critique rather than listen and hear people at face value and hear what they're saying. Uh, and when we are cynical and critical, it's sinful and poisons relationship and friendship. You want to be trusted by what, in what you say? Then trust people in what they say. What do I wish someone would do for me? Ask that question. Think about our context as a church community. We want to be encouraged by one another. We want to be generous uh, with our time and resources. We want to be listened to. We want to be built up. We want to be noticed. We want to be valued. Uh, uh, but how often do you think, well, how am I listening? How am I valuing? How am I serving? How am I protecting? How am I caring? How am I loving those in my gospel community? Rather than just expecting others to do it for us. This is the definition of sin, sin which is turned inward and self-glory and self-glorification. We need to rather repent and confess of that and ask, Lord, would you help turn me outward that, that I would move toward other people and love them and put myself last. You see, love God, love others. We're not even on the list. Sadly, our culture in our day and age, and sadly it seeps into the church, we have self because that's number one, and there's nothing else on the list. Sadly, I've heard people say, I don't feel connected with my gospel community. Well, when was the last time you connected with them? Sadly, I've heard people say, I don't feel part of the life of the church. Well, when will you actually engage in the life of the church? We're quick to walk away from relationship because we don't think we're getting out of it what we want, which is ultimately the most self-centered, self-serving uh, rhetoric that we can give off. I'm walking away because I'm not getting what I want out of it. I don't see permission anywhere in the Bible that allows us to be self-centered and selfish in those ways, folks. Rather, I see sacrificial, laying your life down, dying to self to glorify God and serve his people. Now you understand why I said this is so deep yet so challenging. If you want to experience encouragement and generosity and love and being listened to and being built up, then you're going to have to be part of partnering with us in your gospel community to see that culture come to fruition.
If you, want to be, if you want to see that community materialize here on the world for the flourishing of God's people, for the sake of the lost, we want you to partner with us in gospel communities. Gospel communities are the place where we begin to move toward one another in a safe, caring environment to begin to figure out how we live this out. And we do that not to serve self, but for the furtherance of the kingdom of heaven. I want to invite you, please, would you partner with those in your gospel community and seek to put this into action? That's all I want to ask of you this morning. I invite you to do it as Jesus invites us to truly flourish by living out the Sermon on the Mount, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. I want to invite you, would you step into your gospel community this week? Would you step in and seek to love and serve the way that you want to be loved and served? Step in and pick up the phone and send that message to somebody if you desire that to happen to you. Then why don't you give it a go this week? And there does come a way in which this has become such a beautiful, helpful, uh, golden rule for our culture, our communities. Think about it, because not all relationships in the gospel communities in the world are all easy and, 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 and easy to do, but rather there are times that come when there needs to be hard conversations to be had. There may be discipline, there may be rebuke. Well, well how do we navigate that, Josh? Well, if you were to be disciplined or you were going to be rebuked, how would you want somebody to handle you and move toward you? Then go likewise toward them. You see, Jesus, Jesus is calling us to a radical way of living. And in this way of living, we are salt and light in the world around us. This is what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I am so excited for because I'm so encouraged to see so much of this already happening in the life of our church. And I'm asking all of us to step into that. Because in stepping into this, we begin to be a compelling apologetic to the world who would look in and say, why are you so different? We say, well, it's because of the transformation of Jesus. And when people say, why do you love like this? Why do you serve like this? Why do you give like this? because we have been so radically loved, served, and given. When we think of God first, and we think of others, we can't but be distinct salt and light in the communities around us. And when we live like that, we won't covet, we won't steal, we won't murder, we won't covet another person's wife, we won't commit adultery. When we think like that, our hearts and our minds are totally wired away from thinking of self to thinking of others. That is why this simple verse, this golden rule, changes everything in relationships. And thirdly and lastly, the golden rule was ultimately lived by Jesus for us. You see, as I've unpacked this for the last 25 minutes, it's, it's, it's one of those words like, I, I, I want to be part of that world. And then you hear, well, if I want to be part of that world, I've got to help be part of it to make that happen. And then you realize, ah, I fall so short, short of this. We have to confess that we don't love God and we don't love others the way that we should. We have to confess that so often we use relationships to serve self rather than seeking to serve the other in relationship. So what are we to do? Well, we've got two simple things from the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> we look to God, our Heavenly Father. We look to God, our Heavenly Father, knowing that He is a good Father who, who, who loves His children, who seeks to give good gifts to His children. Jesus is saying all the way through chapter 5, 6, and 7, He's saying, I know you struggle. I know, I know you struggle with the things of the world, the temporal pleasures of the world, and you want to have treasure in this earth rather than setting your treasure in heaven. I know you struggle with, with, with provision. I know you struggle with anxiety. I know you struggle with judging. I know you struggle with asking. I know you struggle with all these things. But Jesus, in all of those awareness of our weakness and our brokenness, says, come to your Father. Your Father knows your weakness, brokenness, and sin. Your Father knows your needs, your wants, your desires. And your Father continues to love, care for you, protect, provide, and meet your needs. Jesus is saying, I have opened up my relationship with the Father to now be your relationship to your Father and my Father relates to you the way he relates to his own son Jesus. That's the sort of relationship we now have with the Father. Therefore, or so, whatever you wish. Remember, it does come after verse 11. It comes after how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him. 
Turn to your heavenly Father. Love God. Love your heavenly Father with all your heart, soul, mind and strength because he has ultimately pursued you and he knows your brokenness, your sin, your weakness. He's out at you. He knows you. He knows to the depths of our hearts and our sin yet he continues to love and serve us. He moved toward us even when we were enemies of his, rejecting him, walked away from him. We, we, we who were deserving of hell, he, he moved toward us through his son Jesus. Jesus who stepped in to that brokenness and became like us. Who, who took on our flesh and experienced all the brokenness of this world, yet with compassion and love moved toward us by ultimately dying to self. Dying and taking our punishment that we deserve. Taking the wrath of the Father that we deserve. So that we could be brought into this relationship. How, how do we live out the golden rule? Will we look to our Father and look at how he treated us? Take your eyes off yourself and look to the Father and look at how the Father treated us. Jesus said, look at him. And as you begin to understand and see how he treated you, so therefore you'll begin to treat him and others likewise. It doesn't start with self, it starts with looking at him. Look away from yourself. It starts with how he has restored us to relationship and then sends us into relationship one to another to serve the other and then out of that be salt and light to the world around us. We're to look to the one who promises treasure in heaven for the undeserving people, the one who provides for, for an anxious people like us, who, who graciously has taken the judgment and punishment of self-righteous, pharisaical, hypocritical, judgmental people like you and me. And he treats us with value, dignity and worth so much so that his own son gave his life on a cross. And has given us grace when we don't deserve it. Has given us mercy when we don't deserve it. He continues to bestow love upon us when we don't deserve it. Continues to extend forgiveness to us when we don't deserve it. And will ultimately bring to completion all that he has begun with us. So look to your heavenly father. Look how he has treated you. And in that we begin to view others differently. And lastly, look to Jesus who fulfilled the law and the prophets. Living the golden rule leads us to the place where you actually have to die to self. It's a life that you cannot do without Jesus. It's a love that you cannot produce with on your own strength. You need another love, a greater love, a greater saviour, a greater strength, a greater energy to be able to do this. And the only place that you can begin to get it is by dying to self, dying to your wants, your will, your name, your kingdom. And when you die to self, you're ultimately coming in repentance and faith and trust and dependence on the Father. And the Father gladly and willingly gives you his Son and gives you his Spirit to fuel us to go and do this because in that we've looked to the only one who truly lived the golden rule, Jesus, who faithfully and perfectly lived it. He did what we want others to do to us. He did what we failed to do. He loved, he forgave, he protected, he cared for, he accepted, he served, he was patient. Jesus lived the life that we cannot and the life that we failed to live because he lived in our place. Jesus, the only truly one who died to self, he didn't deserve to die on a cross, so he, but he ultimately did. He ultimately laid down his life to die on the cross, knowing that we didn't deserve it, knowing that we were guilty, knowing that we had no other hope in this world. He gladly, willingly, voluntarily died to self and ultimately died on the cross so that we could be forgiven, but yet rose again victoriously ruling, reigning, conquering the world now. And he sends his spirit into our hearts so that we are fueled, not by our own strength, but by his very strength, the same strength that overcame the grave now lives in us so that we can love God with our heart, soul, mind and strength. And we can love others the way that we want to be loved. He lived and died so that he could live and love and work through us to extend his love to the world around us. Jesus died in our place so that we could be fueled to do it, not in our strength, but on his. We can only love when we've experienced the love of the Father, the love of the Son, and the love of the Spirit in our lives. We can only love in that way when we've received that great love. And the, one of the most beautiful places just to summarize and to wrap up that love we've received is in 1 John chapter 4. I know they're familiar verses to you perhaps, or maybe they're new to you. But just 
perhaps close your eyes and, and just let, let these few verses sink in. How do we live the golden rule? We look to our Father, how did he treat us? We look to the Son, how did he love us? We now walk by the Spirit to love God with our heart, soul, mind and strength and love others the way that we would want to be loved. Listen in, chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We love because he loved us. We love others because his love abides in us. One of the greatest displays of the love of God is by how we treat other people. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do so unto them, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Go love from being a people who have been loved and thereby perfected through the indwelling Holy Spirit to go and love as we have been loved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us when we don't deserve it. Jesus, thank you for being the propitiation for our sins. Thank you for taking the wrath that we deserve and so loving us even when we weren't deserving. And even while we were your enemies, you prayed for us. And I thank you for sending your spirit into our lives. And I pray that through the power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we would go. We would so go radically and we would forget about self and we would seek to love our heavenly Father with our heart, soul, mind and strength. And we would seek to love others the way we would want to be loved. Father, help us take our eyes off ourselves and to fix them on you. Help us to look and see other people and so value them in the way that you valued us. To so love them in the way that you've loved us. To so serve them in the way that you served us. To so care for them the way that you've cared for us. So help us, I pray, to be that salt and light community. And thank you for so loving us to expose our sin to expose our selfishness, yet so loving to give us the solution to all of those things through your Son Jesus and now your indwelling Holy Spirit. So would you do this work amongst us, in us and through us, I pray. For your gracious, glorious name I pray. Amen. I want to leave you with two questions. Who is someone you feel God is calling you to love in the way that you would want to be loved? And how are you going to do it? Question two, who is someone you feel convicted about not loving well? And how are you going to fix that? God bless you, we love you, and we can't wait to see the Lord work through us for his glory, amen. Thank you.